truth is only worth pursuing to the average person if there's some concrete benefit to it. And unfortunately, with academics, there isn't much concrete benefit to pursuing truth. And that's why we have the replication crisis in academia right now. And it's why, you know, there's so many different forms of manipulation. And this, you know, every month in the newspapers, there's an academic who's been outed as a fraud, you know, who basically completely concocted their experimental results. This happens, you know, mm. with startling regularity. What, what and so... You the, um, Grewander, you mentioned the replication crisis. I've never, I haven't heard of this crisis. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is a major, a major issue in, in academia. So between sort of one third and one half of all studies cannot be replicated, right? And this is uh, in, in sort of fields like uh, medicine, in social sciences, uh, less so in the physical sciences. Uh, and we, we can go on to that in a minute, but mainly in the social sciences and mainly in the humanities. But the, the focus is really in, in the humanities, sorry, in, in social sciences. So in the fields of psychology and sociology, there's a huge issue with trying to replicate studies. And why it's important to replicate studies is because it basically tells us how, how reliable the study is, how accurate it is, how trustworthy it is. So if somebody does an experiment and they, they come up with a certain finding, then if that finding is true, then you logic dictates that you should be able to replicate that finding by replicating the experiment. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen very often in psychology or in sociology now. And this is startling. I mean, over half of the studies, apparently, according to some sources, do not replicate. Um, and this is particularly a problem in social psychology where you have most of the ac activism, the, the sort of gender studies and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. So nobody really knows exactly why this is happening, but I think most people can guess. Uh, and it's largely due to things like p-hacking, um, which, which is, and, and data dredging, which is a related thing. And these are basically uh, forms of statistical manipulation. So if you're an academic, you have the incentive to lie, unfortunately. Uh, you don't have the incentive to tell the truth because the truth is usually boring. And when you're an academic, you want to be exciting. You want, you want your experiments to be published in the New York Times. You want uh, to get grants from big companies. You want to have a big social media following. Uh, you want to be cited by lots of other academics. So because of these incentives, there is pressure on academics to sort of gin up their their results to sort of you know spice them up a little bit by manipulating the statistics a little bit and so this is a very very common occurrence within academia you know you have pretty much everyone uh, in the social sciences who's engaging in some form of statistical manipulation uh, some of these forms may be um you know sort of legit they may be allowed but usually i think that there's also illicit uh, forms of manipulation and you know p-hacking is when you sort of uh, you sort of I mean you, you can basically um, you can do run a, a variety of different statistical tests and you can change the parameters of what of the data set until you get the result that you want and then once you've got the result that you want you can discard all the other ones that didn't work and you could just say oh look this is what I found you know <laughs> and so a lot of people are doing that and they're, they're basically finding everybody's finding amazing results. I mean, if you look at academia, right, uh, there's a great uh, meme, actually, that I found, where it shows um, how pretty much every food that you can think of, both causes and cures cancer, right? <laughs> so milk both causes and cures cancer, um, cabbage causes and cures cancer, according to different uh, studies, right? And, and obviously, this can't be true, you know. <laughs> and the reason that this is the case is because academics are manipulating statistical results because they want to get the big time. They want their, their, their study to be cited by the New York Times saying, you know, cabbage causes cancer or whatever, because then obviously their name is going to get big and then people are going to fund them and say, oh, you know, we want, we want, more, we want to find out more about this. You know, here's, here's a million dollars, you know, do what you want. <laughs> so obviously there is a lot of incentives for academics to lie. And I mean, that's just one incentive. Then you also have the social justice incentive, which is another thing. And then you have other incentives. For instance, there may be um, some kind of uh, someone might have paid you to come out with a certain result. And 
there's there's Project Two Two Six, which is a very very um, startling um, sort of conspiracy. And this is a real conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy theory. So Project Two Two Six, and it does it sound like it sounds like a conspiracy theory. Project Two Two Six, but it was um, it was basically it was in the 1960s, and there was a big uh, sort of uh, congregation of these massive uh, sugar companies. And the sugar companies uh, basically were afraid of the latest research because the research was showing uh, that their sugar might be unhealthy. And so they thought, oh, you know, we can't have this. You know, people won't buy sugar if, if everybody thinks sugar's unhealthy. So what they did was they hired nutritionists and uh, they basically got them to do research into fat, they, into fat and its negative effects on the human body. And they basically, what they did was they hired these people to do a hit job on fat and to basically blame all the negative effects of sugar on fat. So heart disease, for instance, heart disease was originally um, uh, sort of correlated with sugar consumption. And they didn't want that. They thought that's, that's you know, people are going to panic. So what they did is they got the researchers to instead label fat as the primary uh, reason why heart disease was the reason and you can see it today I mean for even me I believe for a long time that fat was the primary cause for heart disease you know and many people even today still believe that because it was taught in our schools it was taught in schools it was taught in universities even like you know the, the UN themselves the United Nations they, they also said it was fat you know don't don't consume too much fat because it will result in heart disease and all this we now know that you know, fat itself is not the problem. It's it's saturated fat. You know, if you have saturated fat, that increases your LDL cholesterol, which increases plaques and all that kind of stuff. So we know that yes, certain types of fats are bad for they do lead to heart disease. But fat itself is actually it can be extremely healthy. So olive oil, for instance, is extremely healthy. Avocados are very extremely healthy. They're high in um, coconut, polyunsaturated fish, fats and all that. So nuts. yeah, but you know, obviously, yeah. if you were to read these studies. In the 1960s, they would they were basically labeling all fat as the the primary reason why people were getting heart disease, so that people so that the sort of the the pressure would be taken off sugar. So this shows that academics can be bought. You know, they can be bought to pretty much. If you've got enough money, you can basically get the academics, the researchers, to pretty much publish any finding you want. You know, so money is another reason. So there's there's money, there's politics, there's ego and status. So these are three incentives for why academics would lie and why we have the, the replication crisis. Uh, the manipulation techniques um, are so sort of vast and diverse. You know, there's another thing as well, which is, is um, called um, hypothesizing after the results are known. It's known as harking. And that's basically when academics will, they'll, they'll, come, they'll come up with some research and then based on the findings, what they'll do is they'll change their hypothesis to, to match the, the results, to make themselves look more like they've predicted the future. So, for instance, uh, you know, somebody might say, um, oh, um, if you uh, if you eat cabbage, you'll get cancer. Right. So <laughs> going back to that. So, so um, you know, it, it, somebody might hypothesize that. Right. And if it turns out that the cabbage does not cause cancer, then they'll change their original hypothesis to say, oh, well, my hypothesis is that cabbage does not cause cancer. So, so they've, they've basically made it look like they predicted the, the finding. So there's all, all kinds of um, manipulation techniques going on in academia. And, you know, this is why it's very hard to trust um, any of the research that's coming out in the social sciences. I mean, generally, systematic reviews and meta-analyses are, are better because what they do is instead of taking one study, they look at all of the published research in a, in a given field and then they use statistical analysis to um, sort of try and find patterns within this. But the problem is, is because they're using statistical analysis, they can also do the same things. They can use the p-hacking, you know, the data dredging. They can use all the same techniques to manipulate the results. And so even what is regarded as the gold standard, the, me the me meta-analyses, the systemic um, systematic reviews, all of this stuff, even those can be manipulated. And so again you know this is pretty scary stuff because academia is supposed to be the one field where you can you know where you're actually pursuing truth it's the one field of human endeavor that is supposed to be dedicated to the, the pursuit of objective truth and even this is filled with bullshit so it goes to show how prevalent amongst the human population 
irrationality is. It's the norm. That's why, you know, going back to the original, I was, I was saying that it's the norm. It's the majority, the overwhelming majority of human affairs are irrational. And rationality is the exception. It's extremely rare. That was a fantastic answer. You reminded me of a video I did a while ago about diets over time and how Kellogg's was really um, influential in the early, like the 1920s. And they paid for all these studies to condemn protein. And there was all these oh. studies saying how, how unhealthy protein is for us. Of course, that's ridiculous now. And there's, if you look at some of these really old studies, they're laughable because it says that smoking's really good. You know, nine out of 10 <laughs> dentists recommend smoking. And it seems absurd now, but it just shows. But of course, we think that today that can't be happening. You know, we think that our, our studies are flawless today, but 20 years from now, we're going to look back and say, boy, that didn't make sense. Yeah. And I'm wondering, like, what, what real world harm are you seeing from these fake studies, from this irrational ideas that are happening within academia? How is that kind of spilling out? and affecting society. Yeah. Um, I mean, so we could go back to what we were just saying about uh, the sort of nutrition stuff. So, you know, for a long period of time, there was the whole, there was the food pyramid and all that sort of stuff, you know. So people were told, you know, just have, you've got to have a certain portion of carbs, have a certain portion of proteins, have a certain portion of, of fats. Um, and it was like mainly carbs. You know, carbs was the, the big part, the, the bottom, the base of the pyramid. So it was carbs was like, you should, most of your diet should be carbs. And that's obviously harmed a lot of people because now we know that carbs and particularly refined carbs are actually re really bad for you. I mean, because they, they spike your, your glucose levels uh, in your blood and um, they can contribute to weight gain um, more than fats in, in, in the typical diet. Um, and so, you know, if you're eating a lot of white rice and white bread and, you know, um, white pasta and all that sort of stuff that's that's actually really bad for you over the long term it can lead to diabetes and and many other issues so you know that was obviously that's one example of how this can uh, cause harm and then uh, if you go into the sort of social justice stuff you know which is everywhere now as well um recently I mean, well actually not recently it was about six months ago about six months ago um there was a story of a academic uh his name escapes me but he was responsible for propagating a lot of the sort of systemic racism narrative. He was basically coming out with these studies which were showing um, disparities in outcomes between blacks and whites. Um, and he was one of the main figures behind the New York Times and the Washington Post sort of publishing how there was uh, America systemically racist. It turns out uh, last year, I think it was in August um, or in July, it was in July and or, or August, he was fired because it, was turn, it turns out that pretty much all of his results were fabricated. Uh, he wanted to prove that America was systemically racist, but his experiments did not show evidence of systemic racism. And so he, he created his own results. And this went on for, for I think, about a decade. He was a long-term uh, sort of favorite mm. of the New York Times did you, and things did like you that. Hear so, about the, um, did you hear about the James Lindsay studies? where he kind of gained the peer review <coughs> yeah, system. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, yeah. the SoCal Squared. Yeah, SoCal Squared was, yeah. was also an example of this. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because we were talking about harms. And um, the harms of this is that if you teach people that the world is against them, you actually cause them a lot of stress. Um, so if you're going out there and you're, you're teaching black people, for instance, that the world hates them, that uh, they can't ever achieve anything in life because white people are just going to hire white people over black people or you know if you're teaching people like this you know it's not good for people psychologically and it's not true either you know you, if you are talented enough in life then it doesn't matter what color you are you can achieve what you want to achieve because we live in a, a hyper capitalist society where employers want the best employees you know very very few i mean there are racist people out there and there are racist business owners out there no doubt but they're a tiny, tiny minority. If you just look at the statistics, you know, there are plenty of non-white people in, in good paying jobs. That's because we live in a hyper-capitalist society where the main concern is getting the best people in the job. And if and most employers, I would say 99% of employers, they just want the best employee. They don't care about what color you are, you know. But if you were to read the New York Times or you were to read the, you know, the Washington Post, it's giving minorities People like me, it's, it's telling people like me, oh, you know, 
don't even bother trying to get a good job because you're just going to, you know, you're going to get passed over in favor of a white person. You know, this is not a good message to be sending to people. And it's all based on flawed research. It's based on um, really, really s small scale studies with really poor samples, um, usually with manipulated results for effect. Obviously, that there's a bias. There's something called the bias against null results, which is one of the biggest contributors to the replication crisis. And the bias against null results is basically what it does is it, it, it what it means is it means that studies that show uh, some surprising thing will be favoured over studies that don't show it. So studies that show that America is systemically racist are going to be favoured over studies that show that America is not systemically racist. Because think about the headlines. If the New York Times publishes, study shows America is not systemically racist. It's not going to be that great. It's not going to get a lot. I mean, it would probably get a bit of outrage from the New York Times' uh, reader base because they're those kinds of people. But generally, it's not going to really, it's not going to blow, blow up very much, you know. Uh, America yeah, is not that, that racist, study, you know what I mean? That study would not get past peer review either. Exactly, it wouldn't get past through yeah. peer review. And it's, not, it's just not interesting. You know? New study shows America is not racist. That's not a particularly great study. But on the other hand, if you have new study shows America is racist, whoa, <laughs> now you've got something interesting. Now you've got something that's going to be published in the New York Times. You know, now you've got something that's going to get people's attention on Twitter.